We begin with Ontario's response to the health care crisis. The province is expanding its use of private health care clinics to perform certain procedures, including cataract surgeries and CT scans, as well as knee and hip replacements. The goal is to reduce wait times. All I care about, all Minister Jones cares about, all our government cares about, is that you get the care you need quickly and safely. Doug Ford is misleading you when he says that funding surgeries in private for-profit clinics won't have an impact on Ontarians. Sylvia Jones is Ontario's Minister of Health. She's in her riding of Dufferin Caledon. Minister Jones, thank you very much for speaking with us. I'd like to start by asking, can you explain how this new plan will not end up pulling staff out of already short-staffed hospitals? Absolutely. So couple of things. First point, most importantly, is we have already seen a historic number of nurses being able to be licensed in the province of Ontario through the College of Nurses in 2022. We've done that work. We have, through our work with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, added more spaces for individuals who want to become healthcare professionals in the province of Ontario, including a learn and stay program that pays for their tuition and their books. As a result of those changes alone, we've already seen increases in the number of nurses and other um, healthcare professionals who are practicing in the province of Ontario. We are also in the longer term, of course, uh, two new medical schools are, are being built and planned uh, in the GTA, historic new changes, because we understand our health population, Ontario is growing and we're aging. So we need to be prepared, but we're also doing some short and medium term goals to make sure that we have sufficient individuals who wish to practice in the province of Ontario. I get that you want to get more nurses on those front lines, but school, even though that you're listening, that is a short term solution that does take time to get people through school, get people trained and qualified for this. So if, you know, in the short term, when these these, these changes are happening in the immediate term, as this is being rolled out, it, where will these facilities get staff if not from hospitals? So again, we've already seen over 6,000 internationally educated nurses um, licensed in the province of Ontario in 2022. We have hundreds of people who want to practice in healthcare in Ontario. We've now worked with the colleges, whether it is the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario or the College of Nurses of Ontario to make sure that those applications are assessed and if um, accurate, ultimately approved and licensed. So we've seen that work happening now and that work will continue through those two colleges. But I wanted to highlight that we've done work both in the short term and the long term to make sure that Ontario is basically ready for the population increases and our aging population. Do you think there's a crisis in frontline healthcare staffing right now in Ontario? I think that there are individuals who have worked incredibly hard for over two years to make sure that we had a protected uh, population. They were they were but, working but through challenges. Not, not to interrupt, not to interrupt, but do you think there is a crisis? I get that that the people who are working on the front lines are working incredibly hard, but do you think there is a staffing crisis in Ontario healthcare right now? I think that there should be confidence in the fact that the government. Your government is looking after making sure that we have sufficient numbers coming through. We understand that it has been challenging, that it is very challenging and important work. But we've also seen how people and individuals have stepped up to do that work. And you have a government who's making sure that we have put the, the policies and changes in place to ensure Individuals who want to practice in Ontario can do so. And, you know, Katie, we've seen it because when we made changes with colleges and universities to expand the number of spaces for nurses and offer the Learn and Stay program, we've seen historic number of applications. So it is working. It will take time for some of these other um, changes like uh, training new nurses in, in uh, colleges, but we've also seen it through historic numbers of applications and licenses being given in 2022. As I move on to the next question, I'm going to note that you did not specifically answer that question. I'd like to play a clip for you of a guest we had on CBC News Network earlier today. It's from Dr. Steve Flindall, a York Region emergency room physician. Have a listen. There is not a lot of doctors and nurses sitting idle. 
throughout the day or unemployed currently that are going to be able to fill these positions. They're already employed. Uh, all the surgeons in Ontario are actively working in, uh, in hospitals funded by the public system. That's the only place they're going to get them. What do you say to Dr. Flindall? Well, what I would say is we have existing systems in place with community surgery and diagnostic. We have over 800 facilities across Ontario, and all of those have stepped up and said, we would like to do more, we can do more. You know, I was at the Kensington Eye Institute with Premier Ford today, and they have already committed and have offered now cataract surgeries on Saturdays, which they weren't doing before they were funded. So we've put those changes in place to make sure that existing uh, community surgery centers can operate more if they so choose and individuals and organizations like the Kensington Eye Institute have done that. Now, you know, this is public money used to pay for procedures performed at private care facilities. Why not use this money instead to pay increases to nurses and other frontline workers in order to retain staff? Well, frankly, we have. We, of course, um, offered and gave the $5,000 incentive and retention uh, bonus for nurses who are working full time through the pandemic because we understand how challenging it has been. We have, through previous year's investments, uh, $300 million was provided to Ontario hospitals who believed and knew that they could uh, deal with some of the backlogs of surgeries and expand either the number of hours or the, the the times that they were open, that has already happened. Those investments have occurred and we're seeing those, uh, those changes uh, be very positively received. As the Minister of Health, what is your position on doctors at private facilities upselling to patients? So I think it's important that we talk about patient options and I will give some very uh, I, specific- We can talk things. about that, but I just, uh, what, what is your position? What is your position okay. as Minister on, on uh, doctors upselling at private facilities? So I'm going to give you a very specific example, and that is, first of all, I want to reinforce safeguards already exist to ensure no extra charges for OHIP funded services occur. However, upgrading of wheelchairs, perhaps choosing a private room over a semi-private room, or as it relates directly to cataract surgery, hospitals offering an upgraded lens as an option that patients can choose but are not obligated to choose. Those exist in both the community surgery centers and our, our hospitals. So you support the upselling of services at private facilities? Well, I wouldn't call it upselling of service. I would call it patient options because, as I well, said... Well, it's options when... that's not... The thing is, it's options that's not necessarily available to everyone. People who don't have the funds to pay that extra money for those, for that extra service, or we're talking about lenses, if there's a better opportunity for a better lens, you have to have the money to pay for it. So is that not creating a two-tier system where people who have the money, and if that's what they want to do with their money, that's their prerogative and they want to do it. But does it not leave behind the people who can't afford it that they don't get those same options as the people who can afford it. Respectfully, Katie, no. I've given you some very specific examples. When an individual chooses to decide whether they want a semi-private room or a private room, that is a patient option that they make. But we're they talking about lenses. Still... Let, well, let's talk about the, the first example you brought up, lenses, when it comes to that cataract surgery. If people have the money, they can pay for a better option. If, if that is something that they will live with for the rest of their lives. If, if people have the money, they can do it. If they don't, they can't. But these are options that are available to the patient with the conversation with their surgeon, with their family practitioner. They are optional. They are not absolute. And again, safeguards already exist. OHIP funded procedures occur, whether it is in hospital or in our existing cataract surgeries. Uh, I'm just hoping you can give us some benchmarks for when you hope to see. What's a timeline here for when you hope to see improvements in the backlog? So we've already um, given some expanded licenses in Ottawa, Kitchener-Waterloo and Windsor, and we expect by March of 2023, so March of this year, we will be at pre-pandemic levels for our wait times. It's not good enough. We want to do better, which is why we are continuing to expand and offer proposals uh, 
assess proposals to see where there are other opportunities to deal with those um, wait times to, to decrease them. Look, at the end of the day, this is an individual, a patient who's waiting for cataract surgery and cannot be part of their community in the full extent that they would want. I want to make sure that we get that access happening quickly. Minister Jones, thank you very much for your time today. Stay well. The Prime Minister was asked about Ontario's plan today. Here's part of his response. We know how important it is uh, to continue to invest in our health care systems. And I've had some great conversations with a number of premiers, including Premier Ford. And I can say uh, we're all very much on the same page. There is a need for more money. There is a need uh, for more delivery of results. Opposition MPPs have been listening in on my conversation with Minister Jones, and now they join me. Franz Jelenai is the health critic for Ontario's NDP, and John Fraser is the interim leader of Ontario's Liberal Party. Mr. Fraser, I'm going to start with you. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau did not really have a negative word to say about Premier Ford's announcement. Do you share the position as the, the same one as the Liberal Prime Minister? No, I don't. I think um, I think. I'm very concerned about what the government's proposing right now. We're not against independent health facilities, but we agree with Ontario's doctors, the College of Physicians and hospitals that they should be not for profit, that they should be connected to our healthcare system, that these independent facilities should not be paid more money than hospitals get for the same procedure. And as you mentioned uh, earlier in your interview with uh, Minister Jones, you know, there's a real risk here uh, to, um, to draining the best and the brightest uh, out of our publicly funded hospitals. Uh, we're in a healthcare human resource crisis right now. Uh, we don't have enough people to care for the people that we need. And setting up a parallel system uh, is going to create some risks uh, as far as that's concerned. And as well, your point about upselling, um, it was interesting that the minister could not, um, or the minister is quite happy uh, with upselling. Yeah, she calls it options, but what's the difference between options and upselling? Uh, Ms. Jelena, Ontario NDP leader Merritt Stiles is against this plan, but I, I'm wondering, let's let's take a look at this from the other perspective here. Um, you know, do you think the current status quo is working? The, the surgery black backlog is 206,000 deep. Do you not think it's time to try something new to try and end that? Well, the status quo is that we have a government that underfunds or not-for-profit hospitals. We have a government that demoralized our healthcare workers with Bill 124 and the way that they are going to court uh, to uh, uh, to continue with that bill. Uh, so uh, am I in favor of the status quo? No, absolutely not. But does that mean that the only solution is to make a private for-profit clinic? No, absolutely not. Many hospitals would be quite happy to use all of the sitting idle infrastructure, that is all of their surgical suite that they don't use at night, they don't use on weekend, they don't use on stats or holiday, they don't use starting at three o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because they don't have the resources to keep them open. They have the surgeons willing to work, they have the list of patients needing those procedures, but they have no resources. Why don't we give the resources to our not-for-profit hospital so that they can rise up to the challenge and, and work on this huge backlog of surgery? The minister mentioned the $300 million they gave them this summer. It worked. It brought down uh, the huge wait list to about what we were at before the pandemic. And that's without building a single for-profit surgical suite. We did that with our not-for-profit hospitals. Why don't we change the status quo through investment into our not-for-profit hospital and respecting of our healthcare workers? Mr. Fraser, I want to put the same question to you. Do you not see the need for the government to try to shake things up and, and try at least uh, new methods to try and get these wait times down? Well, a good method would be investing in our publicly funded hospitals who have the capacity to do this and have the capacity to work with partners to do it. You know, one of the things that concerns me is the premier says, you know, you only have to use your OHIP card. You'll never have to use your credit card. But the reality is right now in Ontario, families are having to use their credit card to access basic primary virtual services because the government cut the funding. And, in, uh, and to jump a queue uh, for a wait for a cataract, if someone just says, look, you can come to my clinic next week and pay $3,000, you don't have to wait a few months. 
So, you know, I'm concerned that the government's setting up a parallel system here and that, you know, the, you know, the premier is saying, you don't have to worry, it's not going to cost you more money. I mean, it's the same premier who said, don't worry, I'm not going to crack open the green belt. So I don't think we can trust uh, this government and this premier with ensuring that our publicly funded health care system is strong and that the only shareholder that counts is the patient. Uh, Ms. Jill, I know you sort of hinted at this in your previous answer, but if there are a couple of specific things that you would like to see the Ontario government do to tackle wait times, what would they be? Give me your top two suggestions for what that could be. Well, first, invest in our not-for-profit hospitals. I live in Northern Ontario, the hospital is called Health Sciences North at Sudbury. They have surgical suites that sits idle all the time because they don't have the resources. We have longer wait lists in Northern Ontario than Southern Ontario, and yet we have infrastructure that sits idle, fund our hospital so that they can take on more clients. And as I said, uh, respect the people who work in healthcare. Bill 124 is something that the nurses pushed against really hard. They won in court and now uh, the court judged this bill unconstitutional, and now the government is appealing this this court judgment. Uh, nurses feel so disrespected. They give us 110% for the three years of this pandemic. They worked really, really hard. And how do we thank them? By disrespecting them, by feeling them that they have no value, that they're ex expendable, and they're quitting in gr drove. We have tens of thousands of vacancy. We have 152 hospital corporations in Ontario. Every single one of them have vacancies that they can't fill. Mr. Respect Fra them. Mr. Fraser, I'm going to put that last same question to you. Um, if you were to pick two points, what would you say the government should be doing in order to ease these backlogs and, and these wait times? Well, look, I think we should have a not-for-profit, uh, publicly funded, independent health facilities that are connected to our hospitals. I think that's a good thing. We should not have uh, private for-profit for corporation, corporations owning those. And number two is we have a lot of capacity in our healthcare system and, uh, and you know, operating rooms, just as France just said, in hospitals across Ontario that are not being used uh, at different times during the week. We need to use those. And the best way to do that is to um, help solve our healthcare human resource crisis. You know, appealing Bill 124, uh, the ruling on Bill 124 is the wrong thing. It's sending the wrong message to the people on the front lines. Nurses are leaving the front lines in droves. Maybe they're still registered as nurses, but they feel very disrespected. And uh, I think that that's what the government should do. That'll go a way to help with reducing wait times if they could just do that. All right. I want to thank both of you, France Chalinas, the NDP, Ontario NDP health critic, and John Fraser, the interim Ontario liberal leader. Thank you both.